Today I'm talking to him about school counselors and the topic of race and media uh, in preparation for our November SC chat on Twitter. Um, so Lee Monwell, we're going to dive in with the questions and I wondered if first you would just introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit about not only all the work that you do as a filmmaker and as a counselor, but also your connection to schools, because I think that that will be a particular interest. Yeah, well, well, first of all, I was born in Oakland, California, which is um, uh, unique in that I was uh, one of the very few Chinese families in my elementary school. And, uh, but also later on, Oakland had a lot of white flight because of uh, white realtors saying, oh my gosh, the black people are coming and your property value is gonna go down. But for a good period of my life, uh, and I lived in, in very poor neighborhoods, which really got me to know and understand black and Latino students. And because I was, we were a poor Chinese family too. And, um, uh, and then later on, Oakland be became known as one of the most violent cities in the United States, which I didn't always see. Um, but a lot of my life, I got to see lots of people of color and, and, and whites all mixed in together, which later on, because of white flight, it became almost all white. But I think in that experience helped me a great deal. And um, then later on, um, I went to San Francisco State College and graduated uh, as a, a educator, uh, counselor. Um, and, um, and then it was also, I grew up in the 60s, which gave me a lot of politics and seeing a lot of issues happening. And that was really around the time of, of black, his, uh, black studies and a Asian studies and Latino studies. So really, even though we take for granted that today, that was something that was uniquely fought for in those days. And so I, I have a lot of background of social justice in that way. Um, and then I, I was a teacher for 25 years and um, both in junior high, high school, also was a counselor and then eventually worked with um, private schools, uh, dealing with children who were kicked out of public school systems. And then also wrote perhaps the largest phonics program in the world um, and also math and spelling programs. And sometimes I had many of my students jumping as much as three years in reading and in math. And so uh, I, I really worked with that. But then I think that the, the most important ingredient of a lot of my training was that um, I, I really worked on working on the issues of race and diversity issues in my classroom. And um, then later on, um, uh, I became a filmmaker, partly because my mother was murdered by an African-American man who, who was a former student at our school, which was actually uh, even more devastating for me to know that and that we possibly could have stopped it. And, um, and then later on from there, I became both a therapist and a filmmaker. And so um, my most famous film was The Color of Fear, and that went on to Oprah Winfrey in 1995. And, uh, and I was, she did a one-hour special in my life and on the cast. and. Uh, well, I guess it just changes your life every time you get touched by Oprah. And so I was thrust out into the public and had to leave teaching. And so for the past 20 years, since around 1986 or so, I've been um, uh, doing diversity work. And um, in, in almost all the major corporations, government agencies and education institutions, as well as uh, working in um, with therapists and social workers, probation, police, um, on how to have, have this conversation. And, um, and I think that, that what makes me very useful in the educational system is that because of my classroom experience, as well as being a counselor uh, and as, as a therapist, uh, I think all of those ingredients helped me a great deal to, to not only help teachers and administrators and counselors, but also to give them practical skills to be able to, to deal with these issues. So uh, I'm just overwhelmed by your your experience, and I'm just thrilled that we're able to have you um, speak with this audience. So the first question that um, I'd love to hear your your thoughts on are, you know, with technology, media is at our fingertips, and it's sometimes it's good media, sometimes it's not. So what is your understanding about how media is shaping children's understanding of race and racial issues in our society today? Well, that's interesting. I think we're just beginning to learn that perhaps this technology, and someone once said even when we had the 
the um, industrial revolution that it took many years for human beings to catch up with with such advances and i think the thing is probably the same thing is true with the internet today is that it's going to take a while for us to catch up because i think it's both a blessing and a curse um i think one of the reasons why i did films was because i realized how powerful the media was in both shaping our values as well as shaping the people we fear and um Someone once asked me today, you know, is racism getting worse? And I said, no, it's just getting more public because of the internet. And, and also it's getting more public because we have a black president. Um, I think, so I think that, that young people are getting exposed to it, but, but also are their parents. And I think that the, the parents, uh, when they get exposed to Fox News, to, re, to a lot of the Republican points of view and conservative points of view, and maybe even the religious right, is I think that what happens is they get a very extreme point of view, as we could probably listen as you're listening to um, so much of the Republican candidates about immigrants, uh, about Muslims, about gays, um, uh, almost really making blank statements. But I, but I think there's also something very subtle too. I think there's also something about defensiveness by whites. And I think that they're learning how to use cliches to keep the conversation from happening. And I think that's what I see today permeating through young people is that they're picking those up. And I think it's not just that they're picking up from the media because I think there's also other media that they are exposed to too. But I think that they're picking up from their parents who are not sure quite how to deal with issues of race. I think today the issues with police violence, um, I think with, with gay issues, I think with immigrant issues is that you're getting a whole lot of cliches that are very defensive, that are very fear-mongering. And um, what happens is parents pick these things up. And so when they hear these, the young people get to hear what their parents are saying is, uh, you know, I feel like we're being demonized, being white. I, I think that have they ever looked at themselves? Maybe they're just being victims. Uh, they're too lazy. Um, why can't they work as hard as we did? So they're picking up all the cliches that they that their parents pick up from the news and then it permeates down young people and i think that that what what compounds that that problem is that when young people are in classrooms that are predominantly white they have no other voice uh to compare what they've learned i also think that there's a great assumption that because we have white counselors we have white teachers that they too are prepared for this conversation, which I don't think they are. I don't think they are only because of my own background. Uh, as a teacher, I, I received what one class uh, on multiculturalism, and that was only reading case studies. In fact, what I what I profoundly remember is that even though we had folks of class, uh, folks of color in our class, they were never asked or shared what came up for them from their own personal experiences. I also think that none of my professors were prepared to have this conversation. Uh, and I think partly because they were um, almost 90% white males. But I think that, that what's even more telling in that process is that the European uh, uh, instructors that I had, as well as administrators and heads of departments, um, also were not aware of their own white privilege, their male privilege. Uh, let alone how do you have that conversation with a person of color. And so I think that, that we fall for what I call these United Nations words, which is respect everybody, uh, uh, get to know people who are different. You know, I mean, one of the jokes we did when I did the conference was, how many of you want to have a diverse world? Yes. How many of you believe it's important to meet people who are different? Yes. And then I said, how many of you are sitting next to somebody you know? And then they, they all sit. And then they're hoping that diversity somehow uh, erupts next to them and that person suddenly starts a conversation. In fact, that we not only sit apart from somebody who's different, but we also can sit next to somebody who's totally different from us and never once bring up the issue of race. Uh, a recent study showed that close to 70% to 80% of white people barely have even one person of color as a friend. And even for those who do have one friend, uh, they rarely even bring up the issue of race. And so so we, we, I think we have a general idea about how we should treat each other, but almost no experience on how to have the relationship and someone to work it out with. And I think that the consequence of that 
in terms of education for counselors is, and one thing I noticed when I, when I was uh, 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 in my internship is that not one single one of my counselors who I worked with uh, had a counseling degree, that they had an administrative degree. And uh, so when I wanted to do groups and get them signed off, uh, I had to go uh, off to one of the folks on the, uh, who was a teacher who was also a counselor in private practice, but you know, he didn't have a big practice, but he was the only one I could go to. So it was, it was very enlightening for me to realize that people who are in counseling don't have a counseling degree. It's more of an administrator degree. And so, and also rarely do they do groups. And I believe, and, I, and what I discovered was how much administrative work the counselors do. So very little time for actual counseling. It's probably more when a child is in trouble or uh, if they're gonna talk to them about classes. And so I rarely have them. And then on top of that, if they're not a person of color, how do they begin a conversation? Where do they find the time to do that? So in, in retrospect, or maybe even in, in, in foresight, I think that, that counselors need to start doing groups. I think that they need to start having this conversation and getting training in how to have the conversation in groups. I think that we've got to start also uh, training teachers how to be able to have groups in their classrooms. And I think that the counselors are actually in a pivotal place to be able to do that. But without that training, in fact, you know, even the most simplistic training of conflict resolution, most people don't know that counselors and teachers are not required, our administrators are required to take conflict resolution. And that's about as basic as you could possibly get to deal with conflicts, let alone conflicts that deal with diversity issues. So I'm really, um, I I'm encouraged by the fact that this group that you're speaking to has asked for us to talk about this topic because if nothing else, that's a beginning. And so I, I'm encouraged by the things that you're saying about the significance of adults in a school building, school counselors being some of those, modeling for students how to have those conversations when kind of the things that they're getting from maybe other places, whether it's media or at home, are, are feeling, as you said, some of those cliches. So I, I love the idea of, of groups being a practical strategy around helping uh, start these conversations. Are there other sort of practical day-to-day -day things that you think? Yes, I actually, you were lucky because I actually had, had a whole lot of them. And um, <clears throat> uh, so, so, so when I, I would like to read some of them because I think it, it'd be really great as topics. And they can actually go onto my website and take a look at these. And I would love to also meet with a lot of the uh, counselors that you're talking about to really come there to give them some training. I think that you can't do it in, in an hour and a half, which is, is actually what I did at the conference. But even in that short while, um, giving them some skill sets, uh, but really, it, it really takes effect. I'm going to another school district in which I'm doing a five part series. And each day is, is a full day working with, with them for five full days in a, in a five part series. So I, I really encourage school districts to try and do that or combine their staffs. So, so I'm going to read you some nine ways to begin a diversity conversation with both teachers and staff, which I think is really important. And then I'll also read you, show you how you can start one in the classroom. Okay. Right, but number right. one is have everyone share their ethnicity when they first discovered they were different and how it affected them and how and, and in what ways. Now that's a very important one, isn't it? In other words, I can guarantee you that most counselors and administrators and teachers have no idea what each other's your, your uh, heritage are. In fact, to show you how profoundly, you know, uh, uh, an example of that is that none of us could probably tell you what um, uh, almost all the Republican candidates, um, other than Ben Carson, what their European heritages are. And on top of that, none of us and none of the uh, debates will ask not one single one of them to share their European heritages nor will they bring up any issues dealing with race, which I think is fascinating. Um, have each teacher and staff member share their ethnicity, and one thing is special about their culture and why. I want you to think about that. How many 
teachers have ever shared with their classes, our counselors, our administrators, with teachers or with the student body, their ethnicity, and if you walk in the classroom, would they actually see it? Why is that essential? Because I believe the reason why white students make fun of students of color is because they're afraid that when the issue of culture comes up, they won't have one and won't be able to talk about it. Why won't they be able to talk about it? Because their parents don't. And why don't their parents uh, not talk about it? Because they weren't taught by their parents. The other reason why I think that, that, that parents don't teach their children about culture is that they happen to be Polish or Russian or Irish, Irish or Scottish or German, is that when they experienced racism, they realize, oh my gosh, if I don't teach my children about their ethnicity, then they won't experience it. If they tell everybody they're simply American, then they won't have to know that they're German or Polish or Irish, et cetera. I think that's one of the best kept secrets for most white people today is they think it was just a natural assimilation to become American, but actually it was a way to protect themselves and their children from racism. And so I really, I, I really do believe, and by the way, even on the United States census, white people do not have to identify who they are, which only perpetuates that white people are American and white are synonymous. And that people of color, and a, a survey showed that something like 78% of white people still believe that all blacks and Latinos are immigrants. But they never once question a single white person that they're an immigrant if they're white. And so that's kind of in based in, in, in embedded into there. And then number three is have everyone share what their definition of diversity is, how they actualize that in their classrooms and work settings, in specific and tangible everyday practices in their relationship with their students, and how they integrate diversity into their teaching practices and curriculum. Uh, think about that. If I were to ask any of counselors today, how have you integrated your culture are other cultures into your cult, into your counseling practices, I can guarantee you not one will tell you and haven't even thought of asking even me as a Chinese man, how will, at being a Chinese man, how do I do counseling different? Are a woman, are an immigrant, Arab, we have never once asked any of our students in our classes, how would you do counseling different? And not just with your particular cultural group, but how could my counseling uh, perceptions and ways of doing it as a Chinese actually benefit white people too? All of that has never once. In fact, when I was keynoting the American Psychological Association and they would refer me Asians and, and, and Latinos and blacks. And then I said, for those of you that have, have referred folks to me, they all raise, a lot of people raised their hands. And then I said, how many of you called me and asked me what I did? Not one. So in all the years that I did special ed and did so well in my classes, not one single administrator or teacher came in and wanted to know what it was I was doing. In other words, as long as I took care of those people. And I strongly believe that that is where the, the big vacuum still lies. And if you want to know how to work with Latino bilingual students, go into a bilingual class. Find out what they're doing. Isn't it interesting? They're sitting right there. The kids love the bilingual class yet they don't even go in there to see what they're doing. Number four, have teachers and staff share what is good and what is hard talking about racism with their students and their peers. An interesting question, isn't it? What's good about talking about racism and hard? In other words, instead of just learning techniques, what about asking counselors? Where are your blocks? Where are your fears? The assumption is, is that all counselors must be all above that and beyond racism and then are all ready to teach somebody else. In fact, we have never ever asked anybody, where were you born? And how do you think that your, 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 your uh, geographical, your cultural and social upbringing, for instance, in the South or Midwest, affects how you work with people who are different? Number five, have each teacher shared their experiences and what they notice about how racism plays itself out in their school? with their students, staff, and teachers. How often have we asked as counselors, actually sat with other staff and other teachers and asked them, how does racism affect you and what do you see every day on this campus? And I can guarantee you that many staff people will tell you that students of color will come to staff of color and tell them what's going on for them. 
when I go into a school and I want to find out what's going on, I simply ask the janitor, tell me what you see is going on here. Ask a hall guard of color, what do you see going on here? And they will point me out the teachers who are racist, the administrators who are racist, but the, the word is, or the work is, did they ever get asked? And if they did share, would their jobs be in jeopardy or would they get fired for telling the truth? You see, in other words, do we create environments where we really want to find out is, and by the way, I can ask students and staff, just as I did the other day was, do you believe that racism is alive and well at your school? Do you believe that racism is alive and well with your colleagues? And people will raise their hands. You see, in other words, we know that it exists, whether or not we know how to deal with it or we're willing to deal with it is actually the big question. Have each teacher or staff share how race or racism affects the student's attitude, self-esteem, behavior, and classroom performance. In other words, are we actually aware of how a child's self-esteem about themselves of, as color affected? Did most people don't know that black students of color, that when President Barack Obama uh, got elected, blacks all around the country had a 10% increase in their scores. Now, what was that all about? Yeah. Um, number eight, have each staff and uh, share, share what they think are effective ways to talk about racism, to deal with issues of racism, and to unlearn it. And also have them mention what kinds of trainings they would need to sharpen their skills and their knowledge. Now, along with this, that the uh, 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 contrary part of this also is, is to share in what ways are they afraid to talk about it. In what ways are they afraid to deal with it? In what ways do they see the racism in themselves? Which I think is a much harder question. I once asked a whole group of HR people in a corporation, what don't you know about diversity? And they were shocked because no one had ever asked them. Think about that. What don't you know? Instead of always reemphasizing what people know is what don't you know? I could have asked all those folks at that counseling, at that at conference, what don't you know about diversity? And would they even be aware of it? And then the second part is, would they, if they were aware of what they didn't know, would they be willing to get training to find out? So you could easily say, well, I don't know what a hajib is, which is the, the cloth over uh, uh, Muslims, uh, women. But then if they wanted to find out, where could they find out? And that's what a, a graduate student said is, the teacher said, I don't know what a hajib is. And she said, you should Google it. But the work is, are you curious enough to want to find out, or will you stay with, I don't know what a hajib is. I don't know what the Quran says. I don't know uh, the whole uh, Islam uh, religion. I don't know what it's about. Will we stay in that ignorance? I believe that we don't even know where a lot of Middle Eastern countries are unless they bomb or kill us, and then suddenly we're paying a little bit more attention. I believe that it's important to fill each classroom and hallway with quotes and pictures from all cultures and discuss what they mean with the students, teachers, and staff. So it's not just that you look at it, but that you start to have these from all different cultures so that students begin to see, oh my gosh, the contributions of cultures all over the world and how they could affect how we see the world rather than only believe that it's only American writers that are the most significant quotes are somebody who's absolutely has to be famous. And, um, the one that I that I have for the, the classroom is, is a really good one. Uh, if you don't mind, I want to continue. Okay, please, good. Please. Is um, have the students introduce themselves by name and ethnicity and share one thing about themselves that isn't outwardly apparent to others. Number two, have students bring pictures of their family, including themselves, and say something about the pictures. Then have the group share one thing that they remember what someone said. So that really, it's not just about you go around, which is I think a very white way of doing things is, thank you, next person, thank you, next person. I always had when someone shared something is the person would share what they heard and how they felt about what they heard. Now, and they could ask a question so that it goes deeper. Number three, request that everyone have lunch with someone who is different with themselves from themselves and who they don't know at least once every week that they have lunch with somebody in their classroom, someone on the staff, Someone of the administrators have someone who's different. Really have administrators with staff, staff with administrators, et cetera, having lunch. So it isn't just always by department and only the people. I could go 25 years 
and never have had lunch with anybody outside of my department or even know them by name. And I strongly believe we have compartmentalized people so that we make sure that administrators never have lunch with staff, staff never has lunch with teachers, et cetera, and yet they look at it. I remember once when I went to a school and I, I went to acknowledge each group and I acknowledged the staff first, the janitors, et cetera, and they, they ended up crying and saying, this is the first time we have been acknowledged first rather than last. Um, number three is, um, number four is have students sit with someone new so that different folks get to meet each other and break up old alliances. I strongly believe that classes, people sit with people they know, just like we do when we go to faculty meetings, when we do it when we go to lunch. And so I think that's really important is break up the class and every, every week have people sitting next to someone else and getting to know them and give them a set of questions they can ask each other. Make that part of the assignment. Have students share in their native language how to say good morning and thank you. If they don't know, have them research it or Google it and look around to find someone who might know. Have the group repeat each saying and have an oral quiz with prizes to re reward those who can remember the most. Imagine by the end of the day, if a student could have the most languages that they could know how to say good morning and thank you. Now, I would like you to think about how many teachers and counselors know 20 different languages in which they could say good morning and thank you. Very I guarantee you that most teachers struggle with Vietnamese, Cambodian, African, Puerto Rican names, and have never had classes to learn how to, to say any of those names or to practice them, and so they can learn the languages. Imagine what it's like to be in a class to say good morning and thank you, or when a student gets up with their beautiful accent, say, "Woo, what a beautiful accent you have, instead of frown and go, huh? And watch when you frown, so will the students. When you say, I don't understand what they're saying, so will the students. And what would happen if you say, what a beautiful accent. Raise your hand of how many of you feel the same way. And that's a really beautiful way, way to get them going. Um, have each student share about a famous writer, poet, artist, dancer, musician from their culture and what this person means to them. Why is that important? Because I think that white people need to pull it from their cultures, not just Americans, but German, Polish, et cetera. Same thing for people of color to be able to really feel proud and bring them into the room. Maybe even bring the music so people can learn to dance with it and hear it. Have each student interview their parents and grandparents about what is like living and surviving in this culture. Oh, the stories my father told how hard it was. And ask the group to share what is similar and what is different about each story. And what you'll discover is not only almost everybody has a story, but also how whites assimilate so much faster and can accommodate and blend in, whereas with people of color, that blending, that difficulty to blend in lasts even in the year 2015 and has almost everything to do with being a color and not white. Ask the student to share how many, the many ways that ethnic groups are different and similar. In other words, having people look at not just the similarities, but how they're different. Remember we talked about is we get so caught up with the similarities that we have not taught children how to notice and value their differences except through foods, dancing, and clothing, but nothing else. Ask the students to share what is special about their neighborhoods and have the class take class excursions into their neighborhoods so that they don't just stay in the, the neighborhoods they've been told to be white and safe, but the ones that are very different. So those are just a few, but I think that Imagine what it would be like to use every single one of those. Yes, very powerful. And I think the question I have for you at this point is, you know, a lot of times when I've talked to school counselors and even in my own experience as being a school counselor, we would do a lot of the things, particularly if we identify as white, where we thought we were doing things to honor diversity, for example. In the cafeteria, all the flags representing the countries that our students are from. Uh, having diversity week, which, you know, a week dedicated to diversity, in, in my mind, is, is it's laughable. Uh, so, you know, and that would maybe, the, that would be a school-wide event that would involve students bringing in foods from 
you know, the countries that they identified with or speaking the language, as you're saying, are those kinds of things to me that when I think of them, they're, they're very kind of safe ways to try to honor diversity, but don't get to the conversation that you're, that you're, that we need to have. So think about it. L let's even pick the most simplistic two or three dances, foods, and clothing. Now, how many teachers who are white bring the food from their cultures? Right. How many whites bring the music from their culture? Yeah. How many whites bring the foods from their culture and the clothing, or would even know? So it's only people of color. Right. So we get to, to exoticize it all, but one more time, we reemphasize only people of color will be represented. Secondly is, is that why are we still having shootings, hate signs, racial epitaphs in our schools, Ching Chong Chinamen, nooses in our schools? Uh, so because we still don't know what to do with differences. In other words, I could see, I could guarantee you have all the flags of the world, and I'll guarantee you most of the students in that room won't be able to identify the countries, won't be able to identify an author, a writer, a famous person, the president, have ever met people from that country, culture. And so it looks nice. It's a little bit like I believe that this country uh, is not multicultural. I think it's multiracial. Multicultural means that you not only value the culture, but you integrate it and you use it. You look at it. So in other words, even the conversation about race, we never imagined that Diversity Week will be talking about racism. It is only on the celebratory. And I remember somebody once interviewed me and said, uh, we'd like you to talk about inclusion. You're one of the foremost authorities. And I said, no. And he was livid and he goes, what do you mean? I have you on this interview today to talk about inclusion. And I said, no, not unless you're willing to talk about exclusion. Because inclusion gives us the illusion that we are together. We are more torn apart as a country today. We are almost all ready to build a wall between us and Mexico. We are almost all ready to uh, export Muslims, uh, Mexicans, uh, out of this country. In fact, if we probably had a choice, we'd probably kick out all the gays in this country poor people in this country. And so when you think about it, have we actually in, you know, improved in the way that we dialogue about these? And so even today, a Muslim young woman is in a cafeteria and her hajib is torn off her head. She is strangled, thrown to the ground. And the student call, says, I'm from the whites and whites rule. This is white power. Muslims get out of here, all the names. And so what do we do? We suspend the student. But what we don't do is, where did he get that from? How many more of the students feel the same way he does? We may look at Donald Trump today and say to ourselves, oh my gosh, the horrible things he's been saying. And yet he did it in front of thousands of people who stood up and gave him a standing ovation. Are we willing to look at that? Or is it just simply, oh, he just tells the truth. What someone says is, He's talking about what we're thinking and he's saying it out loud. And I think that scares us. And every one of those folks that are in that room have families. Now multiply that and then multiply their children who pass on what their parents say to them to other children who they know. And so that needs to be talked about. And then also is, did we talk about having a black president? Do we talk about the gay issues? Do we talk about the, 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 what's it like on our campus to be gay, to be black, to be Latino, to be Asian? What's it like to talk on a campus on diversity week about when you're the only black person in the room? Are you not only have one black instructor, one black counselor, one black administrator? What's it like? And so all of that is still sitting in the year 2015 that we've not brought up. As a therapist and as an educator, I did not get training how to begin it. In fact, I even have um, 21 ways to stop a diversity conversation. Cliches that we use 
in yeah. every single city in this country, and it's now up to 101. And people say it with a smile, and it's going to be on my website. You can take a good look on it. But there's also another one that I, that I do, that which I think is very useful, is to, to do really good training is to prepare teachers for what do you do when a student says, I feel like I haven't been helped? What do you do when a student of color says racism shouldn't be tolerated here at this school? That there should be more teachers of color. No one ever told me there were black colleges. Number five, here we're surrounded by all white teachers and students. They don't know where we're coming from and they don't care. They think they're all open to us and they're not. Number six, I love being with black people. Number seven, it will be helpful if teachers got involved around racial issues. Number eight, there's indirect racism, like you should be playing basketball because you're black. It's offensive. Number nine, teachers should be helping us, not just grading us. Number 10, teachers should teach around the students. They should be flexible in getting to know the students. Number 11, Mr. Smith tells me every day to go to college. I've never heard this from any other teacher. So what does a teacher do when you hear these? What does a teacher or our counselor do to teach the staff and administrators when you hear a staff member say this? I'm going through problems with my supervisor. She doesn't supervise. A lot of it's cultural. I'm talked to. I'm subpoenaed. Number three, I work at two different schools. One principal doesn't care. She doesn't treat me well. You come hourly, you do what I want. She doesn't even say thank you. The other encourages me. The principal treats me as an equal. What would you say as a counselor or administrator? Number four, the district knows we're valuable, but they don't really recognize it. Number five, we want to be included in their agendas. Number six, we should have more independence in our job. We all have minds of our own and can be creative in our own ways. Instead, we're always following instructions, are told what to do. Number seven, basically, we're human beings. We want to be part of the working team. We're people. In other words, really, none of my training prepared me to have a conversation to, on any of these. All the little card that I gave you, that card of what I heard you say, tell me more what you meant by, what angers you about that, what hurts you about it, what's familiar, which is the past tense question, what could I do, and then also in what ways have I also done this? In other words, I, that's only one of, say, three or four cards that I have on questions I was never taught as a counselor, as a therapist. And so if I have, I wasn't taught those, then I can imagine what today, what so many of the counselors are today in classrooms that don't know. In other words, I strongly believe that why we're in the position we are today is that we don't know what we don't know. And we can't just suddenly do a group and then go, what would we even talk about? I think that the reason why we don't do groups, why we don't bring this up as white counselors is, we don't do it because we don't know what to do with the anguish and the hurt. We don't know when a student goes at us for being white. And I think that, that all, almost all counselors have never had to look at white privilege and what it looks like, yeah. let alone even male privilege. How do I know? All I can ask you is, when was the last time you remember that being brought up in a faculty meeting? Amongst counselors, amongst student and staff, our, our staff and, and hall guards, et cetera. So think about it. We rarely have that even with staff, then how can we possibly have it even with students who are even more vocal, even more uh, 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 real and honest about it? And then how, what do we do with conflict? How many of us even know what to do if two students get angry at each other? What do we even do with another teacher who yells at another teacher and going, oh, come on, I don't see color? What do we do with that? We still haven't figured out what to do with that one. Or, or do what we do, what most students said is the teacher says, this is getting too personal, let's move on. Or let's be respectful. But we don't still know how to keep the conversation going. Not even the President of the United States, the President of the United States knew what to do with Sergeant Crowley and, and Henry Louis Gates. He didn't even know how to have that conversation. He didn't even know what to do when the man yelled out to him, you lie. He didn't even know what to say or do, except going, I didn't, I didn't lie. In other words, he modeled for us, he didn't know what to do. And when he was asked just recently, why don't we have a national conversation on race? And you know what he said is, I, I don't know if it would work well. In other words, he doesn't even have an idea how it could actually happen. Yeah. 
And so I think that even he doesn't know how to do a national dialogue on race. And that's why I'm planning on doing these around the country. But I strongly believe I would love to work with counselors and teachers and staff on all the techniques they could use. To, and, I, and the reason why the classes are so great is that we actually do them in class. You do them with each other. That's why when I had the whole workshop was pretty much everyone pairing up. Because when you left, you learned how to do it. You learned some techniques. Not only that is, you left talking about your partner and what you got out of talking to your partner than you did just having all sorts of adulation and admiration for the speaker versus what really got you going was the person in front of you. And that's what I call practicing rather than, I think we're good at honoring diversity. I don't think we're very good at practicing. So if it starts with us, which I think is something that you come back around to, it starts with us as an individual, as the individual. <clears throat> is starting with us enough to change the policies, the practices that exist in a school or in a district well, well, I think that's a that's an interesting uh, question. You know, I, I actually, you know, I think that that I, I never look at it that way. To be honest with you, it's no more different than how did we get people to recycle? Mm -hmm. Okay, we we didn't have huge things. We just started doing it locally, and I think that that you could start to create great change in your school by starting the training and starting the classes. I think eventually, what happens is is that people start to see it's useful then they begin to change the policy. Stephen Covey, who works with corporations, said, corporations do not do things that are courageous. Mm -hmm. They do things that are courageous when they see another company is doing well and, and, and benefiting from it and, and it's profitable. Then they change. And so I think that that's exactly what will happen. And I'm so, because I think that we use that as an excuse is, well, I won't do it till the district hand, hands down a policy. But I think that I did it in my classroom. And then suddenly it started picking up with one or two other teachers. Today, even when I went to the conference, I didn't change the country, nor did I change us uh, educationally across, collegiately across the school. But I put a question mark into the, to the minds of the people who were there at the conference. I gave them an opportunity to see what it would look like if you really connected with someone who was different. And that it was so illuminating. When once that you plant a seed, that it's possible and how much it means to you to see this and how much you get out of it, you will keep wanting to replicate that and do it. When enough people want to do that, when enough people do it in their classrooms and with their staff, then that's where it begins. When a school starts having parents and students say, I want to go to that school, it's no more different than how many students go, I want to be in that teacher's classroom. You know what's amazing about it is? All the most, the teachers that people love to go to, all I can ask you is this, how many teachers go to that classroom to see what they're doing? How many teachers are administrators who they have a classroom where the teach to the kids and everyone's talking how great it is, do the workshops on teacher you know, training day? No, what do we do is we have a great teacher in the building and then we hire somebody else. Right. I mean, that's amazing to me. And today, in all the years in which I wrote a program, the largest phonics program in the world, one of the most successful programs, and only private schools buy it. And not one single administrator or teacher wanted to see my program. And eventually what happened is I got investigated by the deputy superintendent and the school that I was somehow cheating on my test. Not one single person came in to see my program. And even when they finally got embarrassed, and apologize to me, they still didn't even look at the program. Wow. And that was only two years before I left and I said, good riddance, and I simply gave it to private schools to use. But all those years, even today when public school systems are having such poor scores, not one has ever asked me, what did you do in that classroom? Yeah. So if I was so successful with my students, think about it, is what do you do with a struggling student, a teacher, who's wanting to do diversity issues is how do they get supported, rewarded, valued, and promoted because of it. And so my feeling is, is that it's not a test score. It's actually going into the classroom and learning. And I strongly believe if that we keep investing only on doing a training day once a year to learn about diversity issues, 
it's no more different than I all I could say is did you get teacher training for one day and thought that was good enough there's not one single profession on this earth that you could do in one day and yet we will do diversity issues in which our schools are being shot by students who feel bullied and teased for being different and yet we will only give one day if even that to diversity we will even as a country not even bring it up in any of our presidential debates our conversations not one single question on the issues of diversity so if we really value it will we ever get past the celebration so my last question for you because i've uh, taken up a lot of your time and it's been wonderful for me um and hopefully for the audience as well what gives you hope well, I think it's conferences like the one I went to. Yeah. In fact, I've received a lot of notices about that and people coming up. Over, I guess we're nearing almost 700,000 people in 20 years in which people have been taking these workshops. I remember something that Gandhi once said. He said, drop a stone in water and you'll see a ripple. And I strongly believe that that's exactly what happens when people go to the conference. A ripple gets started. People want to know. I think that we've got to remind people that we all can become wonderful ripples. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been teachers if we had thought that we wouldn't make any difference at all. I remembered one a story that I think is still profound, and that is that one day John F. Kennedy was rushing through an airport. He had, a, it was election time. And his aide said, you gotta get going. We've gotta leave, you know, we're late, we gotta go. And the president said, President Kennedy said, no, there's a young boy standing over there. I don't know why, but the way he looks at me, I wanna say hello to him. He goes, no, we gotta go. And he goes, no, no, I wanna see him. So he goes over and he says, he shakes his hand and he's in a Boy Scout uniform, the little boy. And he goes, so what is your name? And the little boy was just, just filled with awe. And he looks at the president of the United States and he says, my name, is William Jeffries Clinton. And on that day, he dreamed that he could become the president of the United States. So someday, who knows who's in our classroom? Who knows that that student one day could either be a shooter or the next president, the next author, the next Nobel Peace, you know, peace uh, uh, recipient or author who finds a cure for cancer no more different than that young boy who invents a clock, who made a clock, mm -hmm. and that he could have stopped if no one said anything, been arrested, no longer ever make inventions again because somebody stood up. Did you know how many people wrote in how angry they were that that child was going to see the President of the United States? Do you know how many people wrote in that, that, that the school was right to arrest him to handcuff him, that the police even admitted that they knew it wasn't a bomb and they still went through it, and that the youngest child in America today to be handcuffed and taken to the, to the uh, police station is a three-year-old. And imagine what we have done, or maybe the story of the student who comes in who's black, who's only s seven years old, and he has beautiful designs in his hair by his barber, as black students did. And most people don't know this story. And the principal calls him into his office. He asks the, the uh, secretary to please give him a permanent marker. And then he proceeds to fill in on the child's head the design. And neither the secretary or anybody does anything and the mother comes in and the child is crying and said, what kind of people are you? And so you see, where does change begin? It begins when we see injustice happening and we say something. We take a chance to be brave enough to say something. When we stand up as parents and say something, so will our children. When one day someone who said in that room to the President of the United States, you lie, and the entire chamber stands up and says that is disrespectful, 
that is racist and you need to apologize to this president. Because on that day when no one said anything, that president's two daughters were sitting in the, in the balcony and his wife and millions across the world. Imagine what they thought of the United States on that day. And so it wasn't just how wonderful we are, but did we practice it? And I believe every day, counselors have got to first look at what they don't know to work with them, to learn from students, asking them, how could we have talked to you differently so you could be more felt heard when they don't feel heard, when they don't feel listened to, don't value. We could learn a lot from Black Lives Matter. They're vocal, but the truth of it is they're hurt. They have not been validated or understood. And we could write them off or we could ask what we could hear. That's how the women's movement began. That's how the women who protested the Statue of Liberty, and it's a statue of a woman, and not one single woman was invited to speak. And they protested it, and they were put with fire hoses because a long time ago they said, why didn't we get to speak today? And I believe that that courage is still needed today. So I want to say thank you, a big thank you, not only for your work and your knowledge and your expertise, but I think also for your spirit and for the challenge that you give to all of us um, to start conversations and to do what we can for ourselves, for those that we work with, for our students um, on having the conversation. And uh, anyway, so thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I so appreciate that too. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you very much.